Hi, this is David Crowley from Cooking Chat, and you are listening to the Eat Blog Talk podcast. Hey, awesome food bloggers. Before we dig into this episode, I have a really quick favor to ask you. Go to your favorite podcast player, go to Eat Blog Talk, scroll down to the bottom where you see the ratings and review section. Leave Eat Blog Talk a five-star rating if you love this podcast and leave a great review. This will only benefit this podcast. It adds value. And I so very much appreciate your efforts with this. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, now on to the episode. Hey, food bloggers, welcome to Eat Blog Talk, the podcast for food bloggers looking for the value and confidence that will move the needle forward in your business. This episode is sponsored by Rank IQ. I am your host, Megan Porta, and you are listening to episode number 303. Today, David Crowley and I are going to have a conversation about seven strategies for seasoned bloggers to keep growing. David has been blogging at Cooking Chat for over 10 years alongside a full-time job running a local nonprofit organization that he founded. Cooking Chat focuses primarily on healthy seasonal recipes along with wine pairing recommendations. After reaching a point several years ago where things seemed to be going in the wrong direction with blogging, in 2019, David recommitted to it with a number of new investments in strategies. Since then, year-over-year traffic has been up well over 50%, and ad revenue is now generating a solid additional income stream for his family. Hi, David. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's so fun to finally have a discussion with you here on Eat Blog Talk. Yeah. Hi, Megan. It's great. As I was just saying before you hit record, I'm a regular listener, so it's definitely fun to be part of the conversation. Now you're on this side of it, right? Yeah. (laughs) Well, I'm excited to talk to you about um, your strategies today for seasoned bloggers because I am a seasoned blogger myself, so I'm here to learn from you. Uh, But before we dive into all of that, we're all dying to know what your fun fact is. Oh, yes, I do have one. It's, It's actually timely. So I have now sampled wine from over 300 different grape varietals and a big (gasps) spreadsheet to prove it if anybody wants me to prove it. (laughs) Yeah. That's so cool. I love that you log it in a spreadsheet too. Yes. Yeah. There's actually a program. It's been going for a while. It's called Century Club, you know, the kind of international thing. People like trying different wines, you know, document. And I never actually got the little certificate the group sends out, but our local wine shop was doing a version of it. And that's when I really started getting into it. And then, you know, I got a hundred and I just, just, <laughs> just kept, kept going. going. I was the first one who went, who hung out at this shop who hit a hundred. And then I was like, Oh, I'm going to keep going and try to do 200. And That's so cool. 200 or 300 definitely took a lot longer than the first hundred. And yeah. So this is probably a dumb question that you can't answer. Oh, maybe you can, but do you have like something that stands out above the rest? One variety or one type? Not not like one single grape. I would probably say the thing is I, I really enjoy getting off the beaten path, obviously. <laughs> That's why I do this. And like, you know, the the one that got me over 300 was like a northern Italian red that actually had four different grape varietals blended in that I had never tried before. Uh, so that, that's, you know, Ital- I do love Italian wines are so food friendly. And of course, being a food blogger, that's important. So, so I would say that's, that's definitely, you know, Italian wines in general, probably. Well, now that I know you're a connoisseur, I will come to you with my wine questions. My husband has been collecting, um, varieties of red wines for the past couple of years, and so we, our basement is like literally piling up with <laughs> wine and I, I don't oh, know yeah. wine very well. I mean, I love to drink it and I have favorites, but yeah, I don't know like all of the stuff he's collecting. I have to ask him before I dig into a bottle because I'm like, is this an important one? Should I not drink this? Oh yeah. I, we have a system for that. So like oh. the, the higher and the, sh- the higher parts of the shelf my wife can open ah. like without permission like the, particularly the bottom <laughs> shelf i guess that's the opposite of a bar right top shelf right fancy stuff but yeah. it's the bottom bottom shelf in my or of my wine racks that are you know only for special special occasions or or recipe pairings now that you say that my husband does have I think he does say stay away from the bottom shelves. <laughs> so that must be a wine thing. 
Yeah. Oh, funny. Well, I love learning that about you. I mean, I've known that you do your wine pairings with your food, but now I just, yeah, I love hearing all of that. So thank you for sharing that. And let's dig into our talk because you have these strategies. First of all, you have a story with food blogging. You've been food blogging for a long time. And then you just kind of re um, dug into it again, like a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. So I've been, you know, started very much a hobby, you know, as a hobby way of documenting stuff I was cooking, like probably a lot of seasoned bloggers do. And then did try to, you know, lean into being more professional with it and, and saw some growth for a while that really kind of plateaued and, you know, probably, uh, you know, maybe five years ago or so. And it was almost like, you know, it was at that moment, it's like, I either got a I'm putting too much time into this for it not to be generating some revenue and, and, and getting the results I want. So it's either like, do I keep doing this and do I really get it to the next level? Or maybe I need to think about retiring this. And I opted for, you know, pushing forward and, um, pushing forward and the last few years and the timing was good. I think it was 2019. I really, invested in some updates and, and really, you know, some strategies that were helpful. And, you know, my growth was starting before the pandemic hit, but as we all know, then, then all of a sudden the whole world's stuck home trying to cook more. And, and needless to say, I felt like I was ready for it because it, you know, I had sort of put some, you know, good things in place and, and, and in motion prior to that. Well, it feels like the timing was perfect for you because, yeah, I feel like so many blogs did absolutely explode during the pandemic. So, yeah, good timing. I mean, I know you didn't probably intentionally do that, but that worked out well. So you've kind of learned some strategies and you want to share seven tips for how seasoned bloggers can keep growing because it can be really frustrating. As you know, you got to that point and a lot of us do where we're like, okay, this is it. Like I need to make a decision. Do I keep going? Do I dig in because it's getting more saturated and complicated, honestly, or do I stop because it's madness? So you are here to encourage us. Keep going. And here's how. So let's just run through your list. What is your number one tip for us? Yeah, definitely. And they're kind of in two broad categories. So the first is really leveraging the broad header is leveraging existing content. And and this is a little bit of a counterpoint. I think probably what motivated me to reach out to about being on the podcast, I heard you talking to Casey and about these newer bloggers just blowing past, uh, you know, seasoned bloggers so quickly. And I thought, hmm, yeah, I see. I, and I feel that too. Sometimes I see that I'm like, oh man, they're already at 50,000 views. <laughs> and it's crazy. But then I thought, you know, we as seasoned bloggers do have this rich uh, asset really of existing content. And so leaning into that, I think is really key. So the first tip I have is really, you know, focusing on updating old posts um, and being, and I think that you hear that a lot these days, but also doing it in a very strategic manner. So, you know, I have over 500 recipes on my site. I know you probably have twice that I'm guessing. And so really having a methodology for how to do that. So, um, you know, I've honed over the last couple of years kind of a way of do an annual, you know, I do it to a lesser degree, you know, regularly, but every, at the end of every year, I kind of do a deep dive into looking at my top posts and to rank all the posts by, you know, through Google Search Console and look for, you know, ones that have that potential to bump up either because they are, you know, low on page one Google or maybe somewhere hanging around on page two Google and with some um, updating have potential to get in that coveted, you know, top two or three spots on Google. So how often did you say you go through and just kind of assess which ones you need to update? Yeah, I do a big review annually. And then I try, you know, I would say a quarterly, you know, I'm checking in on it this year. One of the things I've started doing, you know, an addendum is like trying to also look at like, I'll pull one of the things I've tried to decide is like, which holidays do I really want to lean into? So I will sort of say like, what was, what was my traffic? Like, you know, I recently as I'm planning for the spring was looking at, okay, what was like last you know, April to mid-May, so picking up. And I realized, you know, hey, you know, Easter really didn't do anything for me. It's it's my recipes that are popular all the time. So like, 
you know, I'm not going to worry about that. But hey, Sanco de Mayo, I've got some stuff uh, that does well, uh, you know, Mexican food and Mexican wine pairings and stuff. So I'm going to, in April, I really want to be looking at those posts that I can, you know, boost, you know, boost uh, and focus on updating. Um, yeah, I think that's so smart because we get tempted to try to lean into all the holidays and all of the seasons and and it's that maybe is not a good strategy because what is working for us probably isn't everything, right? So there's probably a sprinkling of a few things that work. So evaluating. So what you're doing is you're kind of looking at what historically has worked and you're evaluating that and then planning going forward. Yes, exactly. So and and that that really helps to sp- and when you dig into the numbers sometimes you'll see you know, oh, somebody's searching. Actually, they found this this you know Mex- Mexican recipe. They're actually looking for, um, you know, a, a chicken enchiladas recipe. I don't actually have that on my blog, but blog. But they found my wine pairings for enchiladas, and because they were searching for chicken enchiladas. So hey, you know, in addition to updating that post that they that was generating the traffic, then oh, it also gives me idea for new content. Uh, related to related to that because people are searching for it and not finding it yet on my site. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really smart and something that I didn't do for a long time. I was just kind of wildly throwing ideas out and content out. And there came a time when I realized, wait, I need to probably put a little bit of thought into this. So I'm glad that you put this as number one, because I feel like what you said early on is so great. And I actually wrote it down and then and circled it. It's a rich asset. Like if we have all of this content, we can tend to think of it as a weight or a burden because it can weigh us down if it's not doing well or performing well. But really, it's a rich asset to have all of that content because you can you can go back, you can change it, you can tweak it, you can create content that supports it. There's so much you can do with it. So I think this is a great point to start with. Do you want to move on to your second point? Yes. Inter- the second one is really being thoughtful about internal linking and really leaning, leaning into more internal links because you have control over linking from one post to another on your blog. I know it can be challenging. We like to get external links, but that can take a lot of work and it's not easy. So um, definitely one of the things I listened to, uh, and, I, and I know you've had um, the the Blog Millionaire podcast I, I heard, uh, and, I, and I know, I think later on, I know you're a fan of Rank IQ, which I, I've, I've gotten into as well. But anyway, the, his tip about Brandon's tip about um, link a strategy for building internal links, which I had been kind of doing anyway, but he, he has a very meth- a methodology for it that I, that I tried recently. And it's like going through and finding the, finding the most optimal posts that are, that will get the most link juice, I guess. I know some people don't like that term, but, <laughs> but basically like rather than just, I mean, one thing you want to do is obviously link, oh, if I have a, an asparagus pasta recipe, maybe I'll also link to asparagus soup because they're related. But I guess the thing that Brandon's uh, podcast episode on this brought to my attention is really trying to find, um, find posts that rank higher, uh, using search console to then make sure you have a lot of outgoing links from those posts. So even if to use that example, asparagus soup, great. Yeah, it's related. And and maybe for the user that does make sense, but if it really doesn't do that well in, in on Google, it doesn't give as much, bring as much authority by building up the, up the links. So now what I, what I started was a, a thing and I use another tool. I think I've heard them advertise here, clarity, clarity to, identify like i think i have my top 20 posts in a task which is do the link updates and and basically i want to do three links into those top 20 posts and it's one of those little tasks you can do when you have a little bit of time not enough time to do new new posts but hey i'm gonna you know get links to you know a couple more of of my posts that are on that list um and you just and then i so i look i have the search console um results that are used to say, okay, these are ones that I want to link to these top performing recipes to try to boost them further. 
Yeah. Oh, that's such a great strategy. And I actually listened to that episode from the Blogger Millionaire as well. I think it was a series of episodes, right? Like maybe a three part series. Mm -hmm. And I did everything he said. Um, So it's kind of not complicated, but it takes intention. Like you need to sit down and be intentional about listening and like following directions like go into Google search console and you have to click here. And so I did everything and then I created like two sheets and started logging them. And his strategy is really intriguing. It's nothing that I ever would have done just thinking on my own. That's, I don't think that way anyway, but um, yeah, I thought that was super helpful and unique. And I love that you're using clarity to track because you can create these magic projects in their pretty much on anything you want to do. And it's such a good way to um, like not just create the projects, but help you follow through and track which posts you're working on, which ones you need to get to and all of that. So super glad you mentioned that too. Um, and then Rank IQ, how are you using Rank IQ? Are you using it for updating old content, new content? Yeah, yeah. I would love to hear what your strategy is. Yeah, like. I am probably using it more to surface new posts uh, ideas and that's been great. And I do it a little bit for updating old posts as well. I do if I, if I'm updating something new, I put it in there into the optimizer to see, you know, what keywords it's suggesting I use. But I've especially liked it for surfacing new ideas. I mean, you do have to wade through a lot. I mean, yeah. it's funny. Like some of these recipes, you're like, people really make make recipes <laughs> out of you know. I can't even think of a good example, but crazy crazy stuff. Like, no, yes, I might be able to rank on page one if I could figure out how to how to make you know sautéed turtle or whatever. It is. <laughs> but you know, that doesn't sound too tasty. But you know, you weed through and you find stuff. Oh yeah, that does make sense for me to to work on updating. So I try to when I'm planning my my content, I actually have a, a recurring thing in Asana to you know plan monthly monthly content. I try to do at least one new post that is one I surface through that Rank IQ keyword research. Yeah, some of the um, results in there are a little bit off the wall, but that's the that's the gold of it, I think. Right. Because if you can figure out how to incorporate that into your content then, I mean, you can rank really quickly for a lot of those keywords really fast. Um, I already said that really fast, but really high on Google as well. And um, yeah, if you do that enough, like it's just like it adds up over time. And that's what I'm finding right now with using Rank IQ a lot. So I've dedicated my like three posts a week to running through the Rank IQ optimizer. Yeah. And I my traffic keeps climbing. So year over year, I'm up 25% from last year, which I know a lot of people are not seeing that. Um, And it keeps going up like a little bit ago, I'd say three weeks ago, it was 20%. And so now I just looked yesterday, it was 25% and climbing. So there's something to that. That tool is magic and I absolutely love it. I'm so glad you're loving it too. Yeah, it's really great. In fact, if I give, if, I was going to just say, I realized that my next, my next point actually, I rank IQ helped with, which I was going to say my third oh, was about yeah, planning perfect new, segue. yeah, planning new content that builds on success. And actually, I was going to give an example through rank IQ, uh, something I found in rank IQ. So, I think for a while, I you know really focused on each recipe post in isolation. Like, okay, what do I and like? Okay, I'm going to make steak recipe now and now it's going to be a soup and now salad it's just whatever i felt like eating seasonal definitely but not like strategic related to oh i already have a post that's doing well what else can i make because i based on the authority that i've built up so trying to shift that a little bit and i think that's a recent thing for me but a great example would be so actually my top performing post is a boneless baked pork ribs recipe and that actually became my number one after identifying it through the updating old post thing and doing an update. All of a sudden, it just started ranking for really well for a bunch of keywords. Um, and so then when I was looking for new things to build around that, I, I, I saw in Rank IQ, you know, there's the what to serve with section and I was yes. like, what to serve with ribs? I'm like, well... That's right up my alley. If yeah. Google thinks I'm a ribs expert, apparently, which, <laughs> which is ironic because it's like that's something I make all that much. Um, is my little secret there. But uh, so I'm so I did a roundup on you know what to serve with ribs, and that's I think it's 
ranking one or two and um, on Google. And it's also, you know, neck and neck with that pork ribs recipe, the roundup for the what to serve with is right there as, you know, one of my top performers. And that's, you know, someone was asking me the other day, like, oh, can you justify, you know, the rank IQ, the monthly fee? <laughs> like, you know, I can just look at this one, oh, yeah. one I idea. Mean, it's absolutely. paying for itself and then some every month, just this one recipe. But like, like you, I've had, you know, the smaller wins as well, uh, you know, just, you know, post maybe not huge traffic, but hey, you know, the benefit of being one or two on, on Google for something that's 500 searches a month, you know, that's not bad. It adds up. Yeah. Um, thanks to Rank IQ, I actually found a few of those gems too. So what to serve with, I explored that maybe in June, May, June of last year. So 2021, just thinking like, oh, I don't know how this is going to do, but I put up a roundup. It was what to serve, what to serve with sweet potatoes. And for some reason, Google is like, yes, Megan is the expert on what you need to serve with sweet potatoes. And I was shocked. I was like, I'm not even an, like I have maybe four sweet potato recipes on my site. So I'm not a huge expert. But I mean, that post is still one of my top posts now. It's cr- It went crazy. So since then, I'm like, okay, well, let's experiment a little more with um sweet potatoes. So I did that. And it wasn't the sweet potatoes that Google was seeing me as an expert. They were seeing me as an expert in like what to serve with. Oh, okay. So I started doing a ton more roundups in random categories. And almost every single one that I put up shoots right to page one for some reason. So I am running with that. I'm doing so many roundups right now, but I never would have found that if it weren't for rank IQ and just looking through the database and like, okay, I'm going to try this random mm-hmm. thing. So there is something to it. And to answer your friend's question about, is it worth it? Oh my gosh. I, yes. I mean, I feel like I'm getting a steal of a deal by paying what I pay for rank IQ and considering mm-hmm. the outcome I've gotten. So I did not intend for this to be an ad for rank IQ, but I do love <laughs> it. So I wanted to just, um, say all of that. But yeah, that's so cool. Isn't that fun when you just see something take off that you don't expect? Yeah. And you're like, oh, I'm a an expert in this area, apparently. Yeah, it really is. It's funny. And, and over the years, you see some things and some things I think, oh, this is really, you know, I, this is really something that should take off. And it doesn't. I, I do feel like with tools like Rank IQ and just learning over time, I feel like my hit rate is a little better, at least. You know, I feel like... Um, I feel like now most things I do, if I, if, you know, occasionally I'll post them because, Hey, it tastes great. Or I do this wine pairing thing too. And I, you know, sometimes I'll partner with a wine brand and I need to do a recipe. And, you know, so certain times I'm not aiming to, I mean, I'd like to get traffic, but for the ones where I'm saying my goal, my primary goal here is to rank, you know, on the top page of Google. Now I'd say, you know, my hit rate's pretty good for getting there, you know, in the, first three to six months. Uh, but you know, they're flops still, you know, so you gotta, right. <laughs> you gotta keep, 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 keep making, right. making them and post them. Just like with anything else, right. You can't expect 100% success, but you just keep going. Food bloggers know how to do that better than anyone. I feel like just keep on going. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what is number four, your number four tip? My fourth one is definitely making sure your tech infrastructure is strong and robust. Um, and I have to say the under the hood aspect of blogging is definitely not, definitely not what I like or enjoy at all. Um, you know, there are aspects of like the stuff we were talking about earlier, like analyzing, like what content's working. Like I, I actually like that, but actually like, you know, when people start talking about how to, you know, get your page speed up and this and that, I, you know, I know it's important. I value it, but I, I don't want to be the one in the weeds of, of figuring it out. But I, um, part of what really helped me, I think, and, and thank goodness, uh, you know, they did it before the pandemic was really saying, you know, I need to get to a better host um, and really have some help to help with things like page speed. And, and I, updated my theme. So I did a whole bunch of things all, you know, I sort of updated my host. I, uh, I signed up for NerdPress. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a yeah. service for like yep, outsourcing. Well. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, so for folks that don't know, it's a service for outsourcing some of, you know, just taking care of some of your tech maintenance. And uh, so I did that and updated 
to the latest uh, Feast plugin. And so doing all those three things around the same time, I definitely saw all of a sudden that really positioned you know me for for steady growth because my numbers had been really going in the wrong direction and i kind of realized that i think some of it was you know google was starting to factor in more some of those um technical things that i hadn't been paying as much attention to so definitely um you know if you don't take care of that stuff you know you can have the best recipes do seo research but you know you're probably not going to have the results uh, holding yourself back a little bit yeah possibly i mean not always but right right yeah if you're gonna take the time to put your content out there and create the content in the first place you want to make sure that it has the best possibility of being seen right you don't want it to be held back by something on the back end and a lot of us raising my hand here don't know anything about the back end like right. i don't even know how to take care of it so i'm I definitely need help in that area. And it is worthwhile from my perspective to just hire someone to do that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, Okay. So your next point falls under kind of a different theme. So do you want to describe that first? Yeah. So the overall theme is to remember that if you want to be in this for a long, for the long haul, that you want to be going at the pace of a somebody running a marathon as opposed to somebody running a sprint because if you ever try to sprint further than you really can you know that, that, that doesn't work out you know as you pull a muscle is certainly especially as a seasoned blogger and retired athlete or something like that uh yeah so you do need to pace yourself and uh you know if you want to be at it for the long haul so um and part of that is like not getting super you know kind of taking a deep breath when you hear somebody say oh you know i been blogging for three months, I already qualified for Mediavine or something like that, that you worked a long time for, you know, being okay with, you know, that gradual build, you know, steady, steadily building over time. I, cause I do think that is ultimately more sustainable is my theory. Um, not to say some of these newer bloggers that, you know, are great, aren't going to sustain it, but I do think, you know, if you have a robust, um, you know, all those assets, as I was talking about earlier, of great recipes that, you know, uh, you know, are delicious and also, you know, perform well on Google, you build that up over time, that's, you know, a strong base that you that you've built up. um, And that, and that's your bread and butter, so to speak. And so you don't always need to be racing. I guess in my getting to the, the specific thing I had have under this is, you know, you don't have to jump on every new trend. Um, you know, kind of, I have to guard against this myself. I do sometimes, I'm one of those people that I do sometimes like that new, oh, not that I, some things I, I'll hear about and like aren't my interest, but I'll definitely hear something. Oh yeah, maybe I should, maybe I should start another Facebook group and do that, you know, and like, and just like hitting at least the pause button on stuff like that and saying, all right, does this really make sense for me? Do I have to, you know, jump in and do that? And just as a, for instance, like, like video stuff and not, I have a do some video but I'm kind of in and out of it and I, it's not something I like and enjoy and um so therefore I haven't done anything with web stories would be an example and not to say I never will um but for me it's you know if 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 I am kind of doing well with what I'm doing and you know it's enough to keep up with you know what I'm already doing do I need to add you know, trying to really look carefully at adding additional things to the plate, um, you know, definitely is something. It's like setting a boundary and just being okay with that boundary. It took me 11 years to learn this. So I say this with love because I know it's really hard. Um, But yeah, like we are so tempted by so many things and we hear all of these new emerging things that we should be doing. Like you mentioned web stories, And it's like, we can't do it all, especially if you've got a job. Like, I know you have a job, David, and you have a family and you have, you can't dedicate your entire life to food blogging. So you've got to set boundaries and draw lines and not just that, but you have to be okay with it because if you set the boundary, but then you're like, oh, I should probably be doing that. You're going to just torture yourself. So 
just I, and I know I don't even know I have good advice for that. Like, how do you get to the point where you're okay with it? Because it took me so long to figure it out. Do you have advice for anyone for me for anyone else? Yeah, I don't think there are easy answers because I think first it's a mindset of reminding, you know, kind of reminding yourself of what's what's the core of this business, you know, and what's the core of that's driving the success and. You know, for I think most food bloggers, that's, you know, great recipes that are well written with nice photographs and all that good stuff. And that's the core. And, you know, the latest social media fad is, you know, tend to be, I tend to think, icing on the cake often time, more often than not. Um, and off, sometimes pretty fleeting. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, they're, they're, as we know, they're platforms that come and go or they change a lot. Uh, so, you know, remembering to stay focused on, you know, the core of our, of, of, the, of the food blog business. And, and I think secondly, also like having, you know, kind of time parameters, you know, when, you know, whether you're full-time or part-time, like when am I going to be working on it? And there's always something more you can be doing. So, so if you if you allow yourself to think I need to be doing it all, you're going to be working all the time or feeling like you need to. So, so really sort of saying, I like basically, so I tend to do an hour or so weekday mornings before I get into my day job. Uh, sometimes we'll do a little bit in the evening, something, like that, but usually lighter lift stuff, like a little social media, or small tasks. And then, you know, we usually spend a number of hours over the weekend, not, not counting cooking, but I'm cooking the recipes, but, but as far as the writing and the other blog work. So setting, setting those boundaries and, and, you know, saying that, you know, okay, I'm done. And knowing when you're done, you did the most important things and, you know, you've prioritized what's important. Yep. I did something this year. I think this is why I finally learned it. I sat down at the beginning of the year and I just like thought back onto 2021 and really put a ton of thought into this, like what worked in 2021 and what didn't work. And then I just reviewed that list. I made a huge long list and just typed it all out. And then based on what worked, I put more of that into my goals for 2022. And based on like what wasn't working for me personally, I removed that from my 2022 list. And that just made sense. It was like, here's history telling me what worked and what didn't. So here's what you can take off your list mentally and logistic, like just remove it from my life. And that has helped me so much. Like I removed video from my life for this year. And like you said, I'm, that doesn't mean I'm not going to do video in the future, but for now I'm, I'm just not. And it feels so good. It's so freeing to be like, I'm not doing video. So if somebody's like, Megan, you need to be on TikTok. I say, no, actually I can't. My list says I can do that this year. So it's like a freeing um, thing to just write it down and it's empowering. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah, I love that idea. Like a not to do list. Mm. <laughs> Our to do lists are always yeah, there's too full, play. right? You just yeah, add so. stuff like maybe I should do video, but if you put it on your not to do list, it's like a, um, yeah, just like a boss telling you that you can't focus on it. Yeah. And I think, you know, just a related thing I've started to think about a little bit more, you know, with, as we start having success and see revenue increase, I, I also think about, and I'll go back to web stores, it's been in the back of my mind, maybe at some point, you know, if, if I really assess it and feel like, okay, that actually could generate enough traffic to my blog that's worth doing but maybe it's not maybe it's not something i want to add to my personal plate but maybe i is there looking for opportunities to outsource things like that too if if you really see there's a potential return yeah well just i'm going to add a little thing in here i do think you should do web stories david because okay. they're they're not a huge investment of your time yeah. and you could easily outsource them i was going to say uh, that too okay. and it's such a good way right now to get a huge boost in traffic and i believe that like in a year they're going to be so saturated that it's going to be hard to even uh, tap into that magic right right right, right. Okay. so yeah. i would just Put a little vote in there. If it's on your not to do list, I totally understand. Tell me to go away, but I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> yeah, I like it, especially with the potential outsourcing angle. And and there are people, at, and that's I mean that's kind of a thing that's pretty great about this community, the food blog community. You have people, especially people who are trying to. I know there's some people that are sort of want to do it full time, but maybe their own blog isn't quite 
you know, full-time re- revenue yet, but hey, they're really good at re- web stories. So help some other bloggers don't want to do it. And maybe that rounds out their income. And so, you know, it's, it can be a win-win, definitely a situation like that. And I want to put this out there because I've had a handful of bloggers recently kind of in your boat where they're like, I don't want to do web stories, but I know I should, but I don't know where to go to get help. So if you're listening and you are in the camp of helping with web stories, please contact me because I don't know where to send people anymore. I'm like, well, <laughs> the you know, you should do it, but I like send you out into the ether. I don't really know <laughs> who is doing that. So let me know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I love, love to hear that. Yeah. Um, well, why don't you move on to point number six? Yeah, and I think I started touching upon this already, but really focusing on what drives results for your blog over time and having that be the core of what you do. And, and I think, so that's the recipe, you know, it's the recipes, updating them, uh, honing them. And, and that's really your foundation as a food blogger and in, in building building on that. And, and I think one, one thing, I guess, just related to the whole thing about updating old posts, something that helped me, Another benefit I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say about you know focusing on updating old posts is when you have that as a priority, you don't have to stress that it's going to be perfect the first time you post the recipe because you're like, hey, you know, frankly, part of what I do now with a new recipe is, you know, I, I, you know, I'm testing it and I, and, and I put it out there. Some, you know, I have. Sometimes it's an internal deadline for myself. Sometimes it's an external deadline. I need to post something for, you know, some reason or another. Uh, and so, so that recipe just has to go live, you know, and gee, maybe I'd like it to make it one more time or get a better photograph. But, you know, if I start seeing it's getting some traction, well, I come back to it and then I can update it, update it and improve it. And maybe then it, then it, then it does become a top performer. Yeah. And that's a good way to look at perfection. You don't need to be, that's the great thing about blogging. You can always go back and redo whatever you can redo photos, everything that you create, you can redo if you need to. So there's no excuse to try to be perfect. You just need to get it out there and see what's going to start working. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a great one. Did you have anything more about point six before we move on? No, I think that's, I think that. Okay. So dive into your last point. Yeah. My last point we talked about, you talked about it already, the boundaries part, but so I think setting boundaries and having fun and they kind of go together uh, for me and, and, you know, boundaries are important uh, as we talked about, but the other idea is like, you know, we're doing this presumably, I, hopefully nobody's food blogging that doesn't like to cook or something like that. Right. You do. We're, I, I assume we're doing this because we love, cooking, creating recipes that are delicious and sharing those, you know, physically with, with people around our table, but, you know, around a bigger virtual table. And so, you know, leaning into the parts of it that really give us the most joy, uh, you know, for me, as somebody who's doing food blogging part-time along with another job, that's particularly important, but I suspect it's true for full-time too, because, you know, how, how are you going to, you know, get somebody to want to try a recipe if you don't love it, if, you know, you're not excited about it. I, I feel like some way or another it comes through. So like, you know, sticking with the passion and, and some, another way I see that sticking with what's fun kind of, you know, I say, you know, one of the ways I think about that is it is tricky when you start getting into all the analysis and, you know, what things can I get to page one, uh, on Google on, you know, <laughs> like, you know there, definitely there's some things in rank I keep that I just don't want to cook, you know? And so, you know, sometimes being okay with like, I'm going to post this recipe. It might, you know, go nowhere on Google, but it's delicious. And, you know, one long-term goal I have for myself is, boy, I'd love to have my blog at the traction where I just post something, even if it's not SEO friendly per se, you know, just enough people are going to find it. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm getting to the point where at least I'm getting a broader <laughs> range of things I can post and, and people will see, but, but, you know, not go, not veering away from what we really love doing about it. I love that because um, it we do get so in that groove of just like everything we have to, everything we create has to 
uh, appease the SEO gods, but it does. It shouldn't be like that. Like you said, we all enjoy cooking, or at least we probably all do. So maybe allotting, like I, f- I forget who I was talking to, but some blogger inspired me and in just saying that she allotted a day a month or something like that to do whatever she wanted, and she didn't think about SEO. And the cool thing is that you never know. Some of that stuff could actually take off unexpectedly. So, I mean, you're like kind of putting a guess out in there, out into the world, but you're also creating something that you're actually passionate about. So that could appease your creative side too. Do you do anything like that, David? Yeah, I haven't heard it exactly that way as much as just, you know, sometimes saying, hey, I'm going to cook this because I want, but but actually, I think maybe somebody on your podcast also talked about this idea, which I'm interested in trying to do more of, which is, I think part of how I do SEO, like SEO research is like, I already kind of have a recipe idea and I, and I just kind of, st- but I play around, see if I find something that will work SEO wise, and then I move forward or if, or I don't, but almost more like cooking something that's really good or like I make something that's really good. Sometimes I get frustrated. Um, I, I think, oh, this is a great recipe. I'm like, ah, oh, it doesn't look like it would perform well in Google. And it's just like, oh, I'd only just make it for myself and my family. But I've heard of some course, I forget what course it is. I feel like someone sounded like and they had some kind of paradigm for maybe looking a little more creatively about how to take something that is, you know, is a really good recipe and finding angles um, that work SEO-wise. So that's kind of an area I, I'd like to oh, explore yeah, that's a, a good more. thought. I like that. So creating what you want, being creative, allowing that for yourself, but then maybe being strategic about the content that can support it uh-huh. or link to it. Yeah. Right? Is that what yeah, you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. Mm, I like that. That's really interesting. Never heard it framed like that. Okay, so we ran through seven amazing points. I love all of this and I liked your overarching themes too. So leverage your existing content and then also just going in with the mindset that this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. For some people, it is a sprint, but for most people, it's a marathon. If you had to leave us with one takeaway, like your most important point, what would that be? Yeah, I would say and particularly for seasoned bloggers leaning into the great content you have and really, you know, remembering it is really a great asset that you have. And like any assets, you know, the more you you think about how to organize it, improve it, enhance it, you're going to see great results over time. Oh, that's good. Okay, great. We don't, leave the conversation. It has been so fun to talk to you, David. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it, Megan. Thanks. And and hopefully, yeah, a, a, few, a few thoughts you put out into the universe. Maybe somebody will pop up and come up with some ideas or, or resources for us. Yeah, exactly. Hoping that happens too. Do you have a favorite quote or words of inspiration to leave us with today? I do. Um, so, I love this quote by Michelangelo. He said, Lord, grant that I might always desire more than I can accomplish. And to some extent, that might seem counter to some of the stuff we've talked about, like setting boundaries, like what's this, you know, want more than you can accomplish. But I think ultimately, I guess it goes back to my last point, like if you're fueled by passion, um, you know, you're always going to have more on your to-do list than you can get done. And I, and I go back to, and I've, I've, had the opportunity to see the Sistine Chapel. And if you look up in a, at a work of art like that, if, if, you know, being an overachiever driven by passion, you know, means sometimes you're going to have to work on your boundaries. I guess that's the place I want to be. Oh, that actually, that quote kind of framed our entire chat, didn't it? There's so many yeah. themes within that. Wow. You chose that really well. I'm kind of impressed. <laughs> that was awesome. Oh, I like quotes. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I live by quotes. Um, Well, we'll put together a show notes page for you, David. So if you want to go peek at those or anyone else wants to go look at them, you can go to eblogtalk.com forward slash cooking chat. Why don't you tell everyone where they can find you on your website and on social media, et cetera? Great. Sure. Those. So the website is cookingchatfood.com and... I am, and there you can get my social links. I've, <laughs> being uh, 
an older blogger, sometimes I didn't always j- grab the right URLs right away. So cooking chat on Twitter and Facebook, cooking chat wine on Instagram, but the, go to the website and you can get it, yeah. get it all there. <laughs> I like the instructions. Yeah. Um, well, thank you again so much for joining me, David. And thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you in the next episode. We're glad you could join us on this episode of Eat Blog Talk. For more resources based on today's discussion, as well as show notes and an opportunity to be on a future episode of the show, be sure to head to eatblogtalk.com. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll be here to feed you on Eat Blog Talk.